Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dan Markowski. I'm a senior iOS dev at NetGuru and welcome to our NetGuru, NetGuru mobile hangout. We have a very interesting presentation prepared for today. Uh, it's about dealing with change in the iOS applications and it will be presented by our software architect iOS, Paweł Kosielecki. We have a short agenda for today's event. So just after my uh, quick introduction, uh, we'll move into the main part of today's event. So the presentation, uh, after which I may have some additional follow-up questions for Paweł. And then uh, there will be uh, some time for Q&A. So please feel free to post your questions on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, wherever you are watching us. And yeah, at the end, we'll just uh, conclude the event. Uh, without any further delay, uh, let's start the main part. So, Pavel, the, st the stage is yours. Yes. Thanks, Damian. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. And not to waste any of your precious time, let me just get straight to the point. Let me just open the presentation. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yep, we can. All good. OK, brilliant. So thank you very much. Let us begin. So today, uh, as advertised, I would like to talk to you about arguably the only constant thing in our project, which is change. And because it is a very serious subject, I'll be using only serious and well-approved learning materials. Before we begin, however, let me just quickly lay some ground rules. First of all, we won't be touching changes to the product core. I will explain that one in just a minute. Uh, all the samples, all the propositions I'll be talking about today are by no means any rocket science. Uh, if any, they're just oversimplified examples, but they should be translatable uh, enough so that you can understand any concepts I'm about to show you. And of course, because I'm a nice developer, I'll be showing samples uh, in uh, Swift and of course dedicated for your platform, but again, they should be uh, understandable or simple enough so they can be easily translated into any other uh, language or mobile platform. So first I'll talk about how in general we had that idea about this talk. Uh, we'll go through any types of changes we can expect to encounter in our projects. Uh, we will talk about ways uh, how we can deal with them. By that, I mean uh, not rebuilding half of the application. And of course, uh, try to find out if there are any markers that could indicate that the project is, is change friendly. And at the end, some uh, other things up. So for last year and a half, I've been working on a project that, uh, to put mindly, changed a lot. And uh, suffice to say, uh, there hasn't been a single month that uh, we weren't tasked with uh, changing either uh, the way we connected to our backend, uh, change, uh, totally ramp some visual flows in the application, and just basically you name it. And even though we had to replace nearly all of our critical components, uh, we never missed a deadline. Wherever we had a slight delay, it was always due to some other components that we connected to. And which is even stranger, uh, we've managed to maintain a good quality of code and, and pretty decent test coverage. Uh, by that, I mean upwards of 90% of real unit test coverage. So the question remains, uh, what's the secret? What are those secret ingredients we had to pour into our uh, magical cauldron to brew such a project, right? Was it this famed uh, single bullet architecture that solves all the problems in IT? Or maybe some innovative way of uh, splitting tasks between people in project? Well, to be able to answer that, quite frankly, we have to go first through all types of change we can encounter in our daily work. So. As I've already said, we have the change to the product core, which basically is not something I'm going to be covering today. Uh, the reason being, well, if your product people or the client tells you to stop doing banking application and switch to do some, I don't know, maybe a game, uh, then there's very little we can do uh, to, quite frankly, adapt or, or you know, uh, make this change any more pleasant. So let's not go into there. 
Uh, however, we have a lot of changes uh, related directly to the changes in business requirements. And those come from stakeholders, which uh, in general are either people or organizations that have that, have that power to uh, affect the requirements behind our application, right? And in most cases, that come from uh, this desire to put our application ahead of competition. So either, I know, to catch up in some cases or to put some innovative features that user want. Then we have changes to security, uh, which in most cases relate to like, for instance, new forms of authentication, uh, like biometrics or sign with Apple, for instance, but also some changes uh, to make iOS SDK more secure. Then we have technical changes, which in most cases uh, result in changes or is a result of changes in our dependencies uh, that we want to update. And of course, changes in the SDK or compiler that we want to use. So. Is there a way uh, we can actually deal uh, with that change, uh, that we can implement uh, desired change without having to build like half of the application? So first thing I would consider doing is separating application layers, starting with removing all the business logics from our application UI. Uh, let's take out this very simple uh, structure that represents a configuration we inject into our view. And as you can see, this configuration is really very simple. There are no complex types. There are just a couple of strings and an icon, an image. And there is a reason for that, a good reason at that. We want our views to only do things that they are destined to do, to be as simple as humanly possible, or even as stupid as humanly possible. The only purpose of the view is to render itself, to get feedback from the user, to react on application lifecycle events, and communicate and get answers from the layer that's responsible for business logics. But let's, let's take a look at the associated view controller. And please forgive me for putting so much code on the screen, but I wanted to show you, uh, this is the entire of this view controller, controller. And if you remove the comments and documentation, you can see that you can easily squeeze this in 100 lines of code, right? And as you can see, nothing too fancy there. Just a couple of dependencies to show progress to the user or some kind of alert, right? Uh, a constructor when we, when we create our view. Uh, some kind of lifecycle events, right? Mostly to uh, report analytics. And of course, a communication with a view model. In this particular case, there is this view controller is responsible for taking user password and validate against a set of rules to check if it's proper length, it contains a capital character, uh, special characters, digits, and all that jazz you have been through uh, creating passwords in various uh, uh, various portals or, uh, or applications. In general, uh, that validation is entirely done in, uh, in the dedicated component, in this case, in the view model. Uh, and of course, if the password candidate is OK, pass the validation, then the view allows user to go uh, go on. If not, then they display the error messages we got from the validation. But the thing here is that this view is really uh, that simple. It does nothing related to the business, business logic. So let's think of a potential change that can occur here, right? Let's assume you want additional validation rules. So nothing can be simpler. We just go to a review model, add that kind of validation rules, and the view won't even see the difference. Right. The same way, if uh, our client wants a different way of visualizing that validation rules, then we go to the view and change how they are drawn. Right. How the result of that validation rule is drawn to the user. Uh, again, we don't touch that uh, <clears throat> that business logic. We just change the view, and ultimately, our goal is always uh, to deliver basically. Uh, quality new features uh, as soon as possible. And implementing that separation could allow us to locate the place, the component we want to change very quickly because it's going to be either view or business logic, rarely two at the same time. And believe me, when uh, clients uh, clients will know where you actually do the separation, it, 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 will be, it will be noticed because you'll be able to deploy much, much faster. Moving on, 
Next thing I would consider doing is extracting application navigation. Uh, of course, there are multiple ways of doing that. My personal preference, because I'm lazy and because uh, it's a very simple approach, is using Google Flow Coordinator. This component basically is responsible for creating and putting in sequence, presenting to the user in sequence, uh, views that correspond in, in a given uh, view flow. To do that, it just requires uh, an access to navigation stack. It requires a way to be started and a way to tell uh, somewhere someone up the food chain that it is done, right? That's finished. Uh, it's finished working. So let's take a look at the implementation really quickly. The only thing worth noticing here is that because this coordinator would create views, it has to have some kind of way to inject dependencies to them, right? And this is done through that uh, unknown reference to a dependency provider. Then, of course, we have a constructor and uh, a way to start. Then, if a given uh, view controller or view is finished, uh, it, it needs to be taken off screen. It just informs uh, the coordinator that it's done. Uh, and it's done, uh, in this case, through a delegate. It also, of course, it can go, be done through a callback. It's up to you entirely. I think just using delegates is, is clearer in, in this particular approach. And of course, in this case, because it's this flow coordinator is responsible for getting user pin and getting confirmation on that pin, we uh, just, uh, when we finished, just finished typing the pin, we just take that screen uh, off and replace it with the uh, confirmation screen. And in that confirmation screen, uh, user enters the same pin, then we just finish the flow. If not, we just go back to the first screen. So user may try again. And just for reference, this is how uh, a simple uh, view controller could be created in that flow. As you can see, it's a private extension and some implementation details, but essentially you can do it the every uh, any way you would like. Uh, as again, it is implementation details. So uh, the question is, how uh, would you implement a change requiring you to put additional screen somewhere in that uh, in that vicinity in that flow, uh, regardless if it's you know at the beginning of the flow or in the middle or at the end? All you need to do is to find that coordinator. Uh, basically, find a place where you want to add this additional screen, intercept that that delegate, create a view, put it on navigation stack, and then uh, assign. Uh, the coordinator to be a delegate of that view controller and wait for a feedback and proceed with the flow. Nothing could be more simpler. And uh, what's important here is that we don't really, this, this navigation is very liquid. It's not rigid. We don't have to uh, know what's going on with navigation stack. Uh, all we need to know is that we own, this coordinator owns a section of that navigation stack and is the only coordinator operating on that stack right now. So adding new views, removing, changing the order, it's very simple. And ultimately, our goal is to make sure that never again this rigid navigation would prevent us from implementing that new cool feature we've all been dreaming about. OK, moving on. Next thing, a uh, very important one that I would consider doing is try to introduce a little bit of abstraction into our applications. And first thing to do will be to introduce Google separation of concerns. Uh, let me present this little uh, networking module, which is basically responsible for executing networking requests on, a naviga on the uh, networking stack. But as you can see, it has a bit of helpers. There's one that is supposed to build requests, one that's supposed to provide information about networking state, a uh, session that we send our requests on, uh, a set of behaviors to be executed before network uh, request is sent and after the answer is received and all that jazz. If you take a look at how each of those helpers is implemented, surprise, surprise, request builder really builds requests. It turns a description of a request into an actual full-fledged object that could be uh, posted on a networking stack. In the same way, uh, the state, provide, state provider uh, monitors uh, for the quality of the networking connection and lets us know if uh, the device has lost uh, an access to the internet. 
uh, the general rule of thumb, as you can see, is that every of those components have very distinct and specialized responsibilities. So uh, if there is a pretty common change to change to let's say alter the way we authenticate user, you won't have to update URL session, you won't have to update networking state provider, you'll probably go into request builder or into those behaviors executed before the request because frankly, uh, what we are going what will be probably uh, task to do is to change authentication header that's uh, that, that's coming along with those requests, right? So ultimately, it's very distinct and precise component responsible for that kind of action. So it's very easy to adopt that change in that very precise place. All in all, uh, it may seem a bit harsh to have such uh, uh, distributed responsibilities, but responsibilities in general are okay. You can live with that and you can still enjoy your life having responsibilities. All you need to remember about is to wake up early in the morning every day. Moving on, next thing we should consider is becoming independent uh, from implementation. And let us entertain that little protocol uh, providing application environment. Application environment is nothing more than just a structure with a couple of data that depend on, uh, on the given environment the application is running on, like basic URL to the backend, uh, request timeout, you name it, all that jazz. So probably when you begin, it would look something like that, right? Because you have only one working environment at the beginning, probably. So no need to overcomplicate it in time. It'll probably look like that. Uh, yeah, because you have multiple environments, multiple application variants or flavors in Android that you have to accommodate. And because probably uh, you wanted to introduce that application environment provider into multiple components across your app, it's always wise to test that interaction so that you need some kind of a fake uh, to be able to uh, nicely uh, simulate a given application environment in all those components you want to test. What those, all those implementations, although very different, have in common? they all conform to the specific set of behaviors and properties that are defined in that tiny protocol. And if you uh, use that description, that protocol instead of actual implementation, when talking to that, uh, that object, then actually it, doesn't, it does no longer matter what kind of implementation is really used in this case. It will be just the same for the client of that object. But let us take a look at something more advanced. As you can see, there is a very simple, uh, albeit a bit long, uh, protocol describing local storage. And if that sounds familiar or looks familiar to you, then you're absolutely right. This is the public, pro public API from user defaults uh, from the iOS SDK. And uh, using remarkable, uh, wonderful feature uh, in, present in almost all modern uh, programming languages called protocol extension, we can quite easily make a Swift compiler do all the heavy lifting for us and make sure that user defaults conform to that, conforms to that protocol just by extending it. And if that API I just put there in that protocol is a match with public API or portion of that API of user defaults, then the compiler will compile it. And uh, basically we'll be able now to inject uh, into your components something that is actual local storage, but happens to be an implementation of, of user defaults. And that's really very important thing here. So no longer from this point, if you inject uh, into your components that protocol instead of concrete implementation, you are no longer depending on that implementation to be actually using defaults. At any given point in the application lifetime, you are free to replace that implementation for what the hell, what have, what, whatever the hell you want to, to replace it with, right? It could be a file storage, it could be keychain, but you want to go more secure. It's totally up to you. 
And the magic here is that the application, the rest of the application relying on that uh, protocol, provided that this protocol is not uh, broken, won't even notice. And it's really, really nice. So uh, just to sum it up, uh, this approach allows you to kind of uh, rely in uh, communication between or interaction between different components in your application, rely on behaviors and properties instead of concrete implementation. And indeed, as I already said, at every given moment in the application, you are free to replace that implementation and the rest of the application won't even see a difference, won't even notice. Pretty powerful indeed. Okay, next thing we should consider is trying to reuse our code. And probably uh, the nicest thing or the easiest to do is to try to reuse your UI, make it as generic as possible. And uh, I would say that probably the easiest example to, to show is how we display our alerts or errors to the users, because most of that views are designed in a similar way. So there is some kind of a callback for, for, for user action, like clicking on a button to accept. There's probably some labels or icons, all the jazz. There is a configuration. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in the liberty of showing you exactly how this configuration uh, relates to creating certain parts of that view, not yet anyway. But trust me, I'll show you in the next slide that it's really done this way. So basically, we have that very generic view. And we put there a sample configuration that results in what you can see right now on your screen, which is basically a kind of a view we display where we detect that a given device will jailbroken, right? So we cannot run our application uh, because of security reasons. But if you inject a different configuration, then you can get, for instance, a generic error result uh, screen uh, like the one in the middle when there is no internet connection, user can tap again to see if the networking is back or some kind of more custom view like the one on the right where user has to go to applic either application settings or some settings to change something, not to go too much into the details. So as you can see, all those views are just getting generated with a single uh, view code that we use and the way it's generated is dictated by the configuration we, we just used to create that view. Uh, so whenever possible, uh, if you can talk to your graphic designers, uh, try to make those views very similar uh, in, in view and in function so that you'll be able to basically make one universal view uh, to cover all those edge cases. So unless it's explicitly designed or deemed uh, necessary to do it. Otherwise, it's always it always pays up to act smart and reuse your code. Okay, then next thing we should consider is delaying architectural decisions. Uh, most important, making them when all the requirements are in. And spoiler alert, they rarely are. Yeah, so let's take a very obvious example. Which storage, which local storage to choose uh, when we begin our project? Uh, probably we've all been there. We had that uh, we had that question asked asked multiple times. Uh, which storage options to choose from when the project is just starting, right? And we really don't know how it's going to be developed. So we can go with usual suspects. Uh, but uh, do we really need core data at the beginning? Maybe something simpler like, like Realm, but in the same time, maybe we will be required to use uh, not only local, but also distributed storage or cloud storage that. The point is, we simply don't know and neither do uh, the business people or the client. And the reason is simple. At the beginning of the project, they barely know all the stakeholders. They don't know what kind of requirements finally would this application have to accommodate? So it you know, brings us to the hard choice, what to do to, to choose something which will give us a huge overlap and may not be needed later, or something that you should be replacing uh, because it would be 
either too insecure or too simple to accommodate storage. Instead, I would choose not to implement or commit to the current solution. Instead, use something we already been discussing, which is good old wrapper. Uh, let us welcome again our old friend, a local storage protocol. And basically, even at the very early stage of your project, you should be able to conceptualize uh, which data you need to put, put to the storage, how to get them out, how to remove them, uh, how to clear up data. It's all there. Uh, it's not rocket science, really. So at the beginning, we can implement simply a kind of a in-memory storage, right? like just a simple dictionary or hash table where uh, we just put all the data and when the application is turned off, then that uh, gets uh, invalidated or removed. But if you want to persist data between the sessions, why not use a simple user default or files for, for, for the big, for initial part? If then there are requirements somewhere along the way to make the storage more secure, we can switch that implementation to Keychain. And it should be easy because we are still relying on the same uh, protocol, right? The same description, the same wrapper we've been using since the beginning of the project. If we can help, we can even use core data if we want to. Uh, basically, uh, if we've done that uh, wrapping the right way, if we have a proper protocol, it's fought over and uh, the implementation could be replaced at any time, such a change, even though it may sound profound, should be easy because, and it should not take a long time. Because ultimately, we won't be forced to ask for you know, additional sprint or even more to replace all those instances in the application where we use user defaults. And trust me, when talking to, uh, to the client, asking for additional time to, to refactor the app, yeah, might be a pretty difficult negotiation, right? If you catch my meaning. Moving on, finally, the thing to uh, look into would be to inspect our dependencies, starting with actually seeing who develops them. So if you take a look at the GitHub page of the given project, if you see something like that and all those nice familiar faces, then probably you're in good hands, right? Nothing severe should happen. This depends. You probably be there long before your application uh, is not no longer available in store. However, always create a fork just in case. Of course, to be serious, uh, you probably won't have to be doing that for LAM fire, which I was showing uh, a second ago. But for all those uh, projects that are backed up by smaller communities, it's always pays up to be uh, prudent. The reason is that people change, uh, people move on to different projects, uh, and suddenly you may end up in a situation where your application is dependent on a given dependency and it just goes, goes out one day. And uh, there's nothing worse, believe me, than a situation where you're unable to build your application because you don't have that fork and you're about to release and replacing that dependency from scratch it adds weeks to your development and is it's not a nice thing to do let me tell you moving on final thing we should take a look at is how frequent are those releases and for example let's take a look at this uh, upgrade to a uh, compiler version uh, Swift 5.4, which was released in uh, late April. And let's take a look how quickly Realm uh, managed to adjust to those changes. And as you can see, it was really fast within one day. Of course, normally most of your dependencies uh, won't update that fast, but neither would you want to update your iOS SDK. Uh, it would usually be done in the periods of technical uh, maintenance where uh, you, you just update all your dependencies in bulk to, to just save time. But either still, knowing that if you have many uh, options to choose from, many libraries doing the same or serving the same purpose, it's always better to choose one that offers 
greater speed. Okay, there we are. Uh, so now let us discuss, is there a way to kind of measure how change friendly are our projects? And just bear in mind that it's not solid science. Uh, what I'm about to show you are just very simple markers that are things I noticed uh, in, in many projects I've been a part of that contribute greatly to how quickly you can implement certain changes uh, in those projects. So the first thing to look for is how much of the business logic is actually uh, implemented in singletons and static uh, functions. And aside from code quality and all that, the reason why it's uh, not a good practice, to put it mildly, is because how easy it is to uh, basically access either singletons or statics uh, in your application code. And because it's easy, you tend to uh, put all the responsibilities, all different responsibilities in that singletons. And therefore, uh, when you're about to change it, it's basically like trying to entangle, like you know, uh, uh, earphones with cable in your uh, in your pocket, right? Uh, you change one thing, like twenty models and images in your application, twenty places just stop working magically. And uh, most in most cases, uh, the single the interaction with singletons, especially when your components just uh, create those those uh, instances, uh, just like your instances in, uh, by themselves, just create them. Uh, it's usually very difficult to test, right? So probably at this point you won't have any test coverage to make sure you don't do any regressions. So yeah, uh, if the the real thumb here is that if the application has many of that singleton static functions, it's usually very difficult to change. Moving on, I'll take a look how long are your views. Uh, by view, I mean not only view files, but also view controllers. And of course, there is no like uh, upper limit of how large uh, a given file should be, of course. But in general, when those view controllers are big, that means that they're doing slightly more than they're supposed to, right? Like logging to Facebook or executing network calls. So uh, the longer they are, yeah, that, that probably means that it would be very difficult to apply a change there. Uh, moving on, there is also a matter of complicated logics uh, in your application, like uh, complicated Boolean expressions, uh, multiply nested uh, for, for loops or uh, switch cases, that kind of jazz. And again, the rule of a thumb here is that if something is difficult for you to understand if you look at the code, then probably it's also uh, it also affects multiple places in your application and also it's probably not very well tested. So if you're about to change something in there, then you have to like prepare that there might be some regression involved. Okay. And uh, as we discussed already with uh, the point where we discussed abstraction and single responsibility of given components, if you can spread that uh, complex rules into separate components, separate files, classes, you name it, that realize a portion of that complex rule, logical rule, then probably it will be easier to understand it in the first place and then apply change if necessary. Then. Of course, there is there are similar uh, duplicated blocks of code. Of course, you don't have to look for them manually, and because there are set, like dedicated tools that allow us to find them automatically, uh, like Code Climate, for instance, which I can really recommend to you, which also is very good for finding uh, views that exceed uh, certain uh, threshold in length. Same with this logic and complexity I've been talking about. Uh, and basically, if you work in a large team with main developers, you'll be surprised how many of uh, common stuff is rewritten uh, all over again because somebody didn't find a proper tool in your code base and just wrote that tool themselves. And of course, 
again, the rule of the thumb here is that aggregating that functionality within a single dedicated tools, it's a great way simply to uh, apply the change only to one spot in the application. And of course, it's easy to test, uh, to cover in unit tests one place in the application instead of like many of them. Okay, the last thing, it's probably good all uh, test coverage that can tell you uh, how robust, how uh, well maintained is our code base. Because uh, of course you can say that uh, if you have to apply a change to the production code, so must you apply a change to the unit test that covers the code. Of course that is true. However, if that code is written well and high test coverage, uh, usually it's a good indicator that the code is written well, then that object you're about to change is probably small and responsible for like a limited amount of things, uh, in ideally just one, right? So the test also should be easy and fast to update, even though it may seem they're like additional burden. Okay, so let's start for a quick summary. Uh, basically, fighting change, fighting improvement, fighting uh, new features that are coming to your application or changing the old ones in your application, it's really uh, not worth your time. Change is inevitable. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. Your application either will adapt to the market by proposing new features to, you, to the users or will go off market. It's really as simple as that. So instead, uh, of basically trying to fight that change, let's make our application, our code base, a bit more friendly so we could implement that change faster and without uh, losing our nerves. Then, as harsh as it may seem, we are the only people as developers responsible for the code that goes into our code base. It's not the client, it's not graphic designer, it's not our testers, it's not business people, it's us, unfortunately. Or fortunately, it's us who actually push that green, hope it's green, not red, button uh, on a GitHub to merge PRs into our code base. So it's our responsibility to leverage uh, being able to deliver uh, new functionalities uh, to the application and basically maintaining that uh, code base in a state where it's still relatively easy to, to implement new things and that code base is, is stable. Next, you probably should be asking right now, which of those rules should I apply first or try applying first? And I like to use uh, something called Pareto law, or Pareto rule, which states that uh, across all the possible uh, tasks, only 20%, the most important ones, relate to over 80% of the overall result. So if you ask me, I would go or start with removing business logic uh, from our interface, user interface, uh, implementing that dedicated navigation component and introducing abstraction uh, into our application. I think those three things are the most important and doing them, implementing them step by step in your app should really come a great way in helping you maintain or take ownership of, of your code base. Next, uh, they probably should be thinking right now, okay, so should I allow any kind of change even if I don't feel like this change is necessary or uh, it's well thought over? No, absolutely. Basically, you should always think before you uh, commit to do any change uh, in your application. Uh, you should always do a do a good grooming with your team. You should always take a detailed see alternatives. Maybe you'll be able to propose a different, more uh, sustainable or easy to just easier to implement solution that will also do almost the same, uh, provide the same business value as a solution suggested by, by your client. Just one word of notice: uh, it's always pays up to. Uh, if you want to talk or negotiate with, with your client or business people to use their language, which is money, uh, to try to visualize how much money they can save with the solution you're uh, proposing, in the long run, 
in the short run, uh, how much is it going to cost in, in sprints or in, in just man hours uh, to basically give your client a clear outlook on you know what, what you're proposing, how expensive would it be and what would it gain in the long run or in the short run with that uh, proposition. And finally, uh, it's, uh, it's trivial actually, but dealing with with the change in a way that it's manageable in your application. It's, it's, it seems simple, but it's never easy. It's going to take a while for you to start implementing uh, the better code. It always takes time to fight legacy and so on and so forth. But the end result, so being able to go to your code base and basically find out immediately where to put your change, where, where, are, uh, where the certain things are implemented and so on, making those changes without fear that you're breaking something because your tests are going to catch it it's a great reward i think it's really worth investing all that time so on my final thoughts uh, actively resisting change on a like a basic level uh trying not to allow any improvement in the application trying to deliberately stall uh changes being uh being introduced into your app it's like well <laughs> for lack of a better word, like fighting with alcohol, right? Uh, you just cannot win that battle. <laughs> Change will happen eventually. And uh, maybe except for some genetically uh, predisposed individuals that have capacity of uh, ingesting like huge amounts of the proper substances, right? Uh, it's it's almost always ends up in a lose. All we can hope for is to draw that that game, and probably uh, that's the best result we as developers can hope for. So uh, become friendly with that change, uh, introduce it in steps, and make sure application is is in a state where that change could be pretty easily applied. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to all of you. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thanks a lot, Pavel, for this really interesting and full of useful knowledge. I'm sure not only iOS devs enjoyed it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure all, all of us, all of us technical people. And actually, we have a few questions from our audience. Brilliant. Uh, are, you, are you ready for them? Sure, hope so. OK, let's do it. So let's start <coughs> with a question from M. Yeah, we have a user with this username. So let's assume we've just uh, received a huge legacy project that has lots of nasty uh, code and tight deadlines at the same time. How can we talk the client into having more time for improving the code base? Yeah, so uh, basically that's the story of life of our lives, right? Uh, at, at any point, we just receive a project which is uh, not very well maintained, and the client wants you know to be fixed immediately and shipped uh, with tons of cool features. So what should we do? Uh, there's at least a couple of things I can think of right now. First is not to use words starting with R, which is refactoring. Basically. The thing here is that most of our clients uh, don't want to spend money on without actually getting any business value in return, right? So instead of spending like two weeks on refactoring or entire sprint, we should try to mix a bit of a business value with a bit of refactoring. There is a good thing called Boy Scout rule, which basically states that you should leave a campsite a bit more tidier than, than, uh, than the state it was when you arrived in. So you do a little bit of both. So let's say you are supposed to add an additional way of logging into the application, but uh, basically uh, your login is uh, not very, uh, not implemented in the way you would like it to be. So basically you're, you, you're going to touch this not working this way or another. So I would just go in a refactor that went working module as well. So you can explain to the client that, OK, I can do it right now. It would take probably a week. Or I can go in and do it the proper way so that uh, we'll be covered in tests. It will be uh, in a dedicated module. So we can, so literally speaking, put that module on the shelf. And until it is changed again, we don't have to worry about it 
uh, any longer. It will always be uh, working the same way. It will never change because it's kind of uh, secured that way. Uh, what's there uh, about the release schedules? Most of the uh, releases, in my experience, are the ones that the client just put themselves, right? Uh, unless, of course, the release is tied to um, like a particular marketing event. In that case, it, it just couldn't be moved. And the rest of them, I think it's just a matter of, of negotiation, ne negotiation and just showing to the client, look, for now, uh, it will will start working a, a bit slower. But in the long run, in a month or two, that speed will pick up because we'll will be at that time will be dealt with a lot of this legacy code, right? And then what's probably most important in this case is that the same change visually, like adding new screen, like adding new login methods, should take the same time right now, half a year from here, and a year from here, right? In a timetable. Whereas if you leave the legacy there, it will take subsequently longer, right? It will take two weeks. Uh, within six months and like a month when when you're you know a, a year later in the project lifetime so probably that's something I'll be telling the client cool thank you Pavel uh, hopefully it answers your question and um, if it doesn't please let us know in the comments uh, actually on this topic uh, on this topic uh, M uh, touched the uh, topic of improving the code base maintaining the code base I would have a follow-up question here. So now more and more uh, iOS projects, uh, yeah, in them we use, uh, we start using Swift UI. And uh, while talking about Swift UI, there's like a specific structure of code, specific architecture there. How uh, do the rules that you mentioned about in your presentation apply to Swift UI projects? Yeah, sure, it's a great follow up. So basically, uh, in the long run, uh, of course, there'll be different uh, rules applying to certain SwiftUI specific stuff like navigation, for instance, because you're probably using uh, navigation links instead of like dedicated component to put uh, views uh, in, in a particular order in the flow, right? Because again, uh, we don't want uh, imperative navigation, rather uh, the one that is, is provided to us by, by the SwiftUI framework. But uh, the business logic itself, uh, just the same rules, right? It's the same separation, it's the same uh, uh, abstraction that you apply to the business logic in SwiftUI and, and UI Kit. Uh, maybe communication would be a bit different. Probably if you want to test SwiftUI views, uh, you at the beginning at least will have to uh, focus more on integration tests like snapshots, for instance. Uh, just embed those Swift UIs used into UI Kit and basically make the snapshots on some fixture data. But in the long run, uh, this is just testing views, right? It's probably the least, the last, you know, thing that we uh, we would like to have that problem in our application that our reviews are not tested, right? Where the rest of the application already is. So uh, it, it's in general, most of those rules apply. Probably that part with views, uh, especially navigation. Uh, would not apply one to one, but in terms of like creating sub views, for instance, with dedicated purpose, right, is the same in Swift UI and UI Kit, and and basically all the good projects in UI Kit also try to like grind down those views to 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 have like multiple sub views, reusable ones that you can you know put in multiple places, like Lego pieces. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense actually. Yeah, the concept is the same. You can, you can still do this separation of concerns, single, responsi single responsibility principle. Yeah, you just make this view model observable and yeah, it's the same. Let's move on to the next question from Shimon. Actually, it's a two-part question. Uh, wonderful presentation, Pavel. I agree, we all agree. Uh, I would have a question regarding changes in the mobile industry stack. Uh, Flutter is growing, Kotlin multi-platform is making its first steps to try to take uh, over the market. What's your prediction? Will these technologies be able to break through or will native app development prevail in the long run? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> Actually, uh, if I had my crystal ball <laughs> down here, I would probably, you know, 
uh, consulted right now. The thing here is that uh, ultimately it all depends on the usage, right? It depends what we uh, really need from, from a particular uh, application. What purpose does it serve? In that I mean, if we are a startup, for instance, and we want to get the market as fast as possible on as many platforms as possible, uh, then probably uh, your weapon of choice would be something across platform like Kotlin uh, for multi-platform or uh, or Flutter, right? Because it allows you know a great way to uh, quickly implement uh, really nice looking applications across the platform. The problem uh, actually begins where you have to apply like platform specific solutions. Uh, for example, we had a project that had to communicate with external uh, device on the Bluetooth and that unfortunately that bridge that communication had to be written in uh, like a native code unfortunately and the rest of the application was written in uh, React Native and basically the amount of work that was put into that bridge because you have to make two of them for Android and iOS as well uh, then wrap it around with nat React Native code then make sure that she communicates with the SDK that get that data from that device. And honestly, after a long run, I would have just started it natively. And uh, but at this point, again, as I already mentioned in the in this presentation, they might have not known that it will evolve like this. So it's very important, you know, to think of it as much as possible. But eventually, uh, sometimes the reality just just surprises you because again it was a startup they wanted to do fast so they went with cross platform technology it was very simple UI uh, but very nice nice looking and easily uh, doable with what React Native provided at that moment so that kind of application so it was a right call at this uh, this particular time <laughs> but uh, in the long run it turned out to be uh, you know like a real problem uh, to, to maintain it because uh, you needed both React Native guys and native guys to take care of the application, which uh, yeah, in the long run is, is not very sustainable. But as for uh, Kotlin or uh, basically all, the, all those new cross-platform uh, technologies, uh, Kotlin multi-platform, of course, uh, and Flutter, uh, I'm a really huge fan. I like it. But again, for those very simple and uh, straightforward products. Uh, because uh, if we want to do something that is platform specific or it's very low level in a way, then it might be problematic. Uh, you might end up having to do that kind of bridging technology. Of course, it can be done. It's even easier uh, than, than React Native. But still, yeah, something you should consider. So yeah, I hope you answered <laughs> your question. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Pavel. Thanks, Shimon, for your uh, question. And yeah, just to quickly, uh, just quickly, one uh, comment on this. I had one uh, one situation about this. Uh, yeah, related to using uh, cross-platform uh, frameworks. And yeah, we ended up at the end. Okay, so we said, okay, we are using a Cordova multi-platform framework. We'll have one code base and we just compile our app to Android and iOS. And I think at that time, even to Windows Phone, I'm not sure. But yeah, we said, okay, one code, uh, three platforms, easy, easy, cheap. But at the end, we ended up uh, maintaining uh, free code bases. So we ended up maintaining JavaScript uh, code, then iOS one, Android one, and Windows Phone one. So four platforms. So it depends on the project. Yeah. But anyway, if you want results fast, then I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it's 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 not even uh, something to think of. We just pick, you know, the, the best cross platform you can think of. Right now it's probably Flutter and start implementing whatever you need. But again, uh, if it's just a proof of concept, you're good with that. But then if you, for instance, get your next level of financing in your startup, then it's worth taking a stop and taking a look whether what you want to implement next is really doable using that technology and sustainable in the long run, as you mentioned. So not to end up in like having uh, four code bases in one code base, right? <laughs> Uh, or the other way around, uh, as it sometimes happens. So basically, uh, 
it's uh, if if you can talk your client into respecting that uh, that approach, so that you know we just make a POC, we see how it works, we get another uh, like round of financing, and then we make a choice whether we stick to that or we need to start from scratch because sometimes it might be cheaper in the long run again. Yep, correct. So let's maybe try to answer one more question or maybe two. So there's a question from Katzper. What do we do in a project that in, is weeks before a release and it turns out that a huge part of uh, logic needs to be changed? Uh, how do we explain to the client how big uh, of a deal it is and how can we affect release deadline? Okay, so um, as I said, usually those deadlines are movable but it all depends on, on the client. And uh, it depends on what kind of contract you actually our company signed with that client. Sometimes those uh, those those uh, release dates cannot be moved, but let's assume that they can. What I usually come up with is I present a kind of a, a both short and long-term plan. I analyze what I have in front of me as a code base as a whole and say, okay, for that sprint or that release, you want me to, again, uh, change the way users authenticating, right? From, I don't know, just uh, pure uh, uh, password and email with access token into a refreshing access token pair, okay? Pretty similar uh, and, and standard change that is basically forced by security in, in multiple projects. So if I see that this login is, uh, th this whole logging stuff is, is not really done the, way, the right way, I just say, okay, what I need to do right now is I'm putting myself as a car mechanic, mechanic, right? Or a dentist. Before a dentist or car mechanic is about to, you know, if you come to them and say, okay, my car is not braking properly, what they do first is they examine the car. And that's what we are doing at the first uh, approach. Then they say, okay, I can see that uh, you know, your your braking pads are almost done, but also your, uh, basically your entire braking system needs, needs a recall. So I can, you know, let you go with new braking pads, but it will break in a week, right? And uh, so for me to be, you know, fruit, truthful to you and basically uh, deliver a good quality for you, my dear client, I need to remove you know, the, this portion that is bad and replace it, but I would do only that, right? So probably you're gonna need like two times that much of time that, that you want me to do, but then you'll be safe to travel with your car, okay? If you don't want to do it, uh, then we can make a simple fix, but then we'll mark it as a simple fix. And the first thing we do after the release, we go there, and we implement it the proper way. That's the kind of contract you know you you uh, you do with your client because obviously, for instance, it might be that you are about to travel, you know, across Europe, uh, and, and you need that breaking pads, right? And and you'll be back in a couple of days, and probably they shouldn't break at this point. But then, first thing you do, you just come to me and replace the entire breaking system because it's going to break this way or another, maybe in a week, maybe in two weeks, it has to be replaced. And that's a kind of, a, you know, being just fruitful, truthful to your client, just presenting away how it is. If you want it right now, sorry, if you want it right now, uh, then we can do it. But then later on, it, it's going to have to be done in the proper way. And uh, in most cases, if you back it up with numbers, uh, with uh, basically, uh, the long-term and short-term benefits the client can, client can get, in most cases, you'll be successful. Of course, it depends on the client. There are some cases that uh, are very difficult to explain anything to, but uh, I think it's just minority. Most of the clients want their application to succeed. I think all of them do, and want it to be, you know, as the, the best version of that application as it could be. And if you just tune up to kind of uh, explain it in the way those clients can understand, you're far likely, far more likely to, to be successful in getting that amount of time you need. Cool. Thank you, Paweł. Thank you for your presentation, for the answers. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Unfortunately, uh, we are 
running out of time. So yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't manage to read uh, all your comments or your questions during this uh, event, but uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us on our social platforms or by uh, hangout at uh, netguru.com email, and we'll try to uh, get back to you as well with our answers. And yeah, please follow us, keep an eye on, uh, on our accounts, so you will be up to date with our uh, upcoming events. And uh, we are just about to post a link to a feedback form, so you could express what you liked about our presentation, about our event in general, what we could improve the next time. And yeah, enjoy your evening, afternoon, morning, depending on when you are. Wherever you are. And, <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. Take and care and see you, see you next around. Time. Bye.